Today we are in the Gospel of John, chapter 8. Last time we ended with verses 32, 31 and 32. Now those two verses tie in pretty close to the teaching today, the next text. So I'm going to back up and begin reading at verse 31, reading from the New King James Version, Gospel of John, chapter 8. Verse 31, Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And they answered, We are Abraham's descendants and have never been in bondage to anyone. So how can you say, You will be made free? Jesus answered them, Most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if, a, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. I know that you are Abraham's descendants, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. I speak what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have seen with your father. And they answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, If you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth, which I heard from God. Abraham didn't do this. You do the deeds of your father. Then they said to him, We were not born of fornication. We have one father, God. Verse 42, Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Nor have I come of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Because you are not able to listen to my word. You are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there's no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he's a liar and the father of it. But because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me? Which of you convicts me of sin? And if I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? He who is of God hears God's word. Therefore, you do not hear because you are not of God. Then the Jews answered and said to him, Do we not rightly say that you're a Samaritan and have a demon? Jesus answered, I, don't have, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father, and you dishonor me. And I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks and judges. Most assuredly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never see death. Wow. <clears throat> Pretty strong words there, but as a, as a quick review, we studied this, the passage uh, earlier and uh, <clears throat> containing one of the most quoted and most beautiful promises of Jesus that's most, most often quoted out of context. And studying the entire passage, we put together uh, a sequence that brings true freedom in Christ. So I'm going to review verses 31 and 32 for a moment. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. <clears throat> now, Jesus made a distinction here between those who said they were disciples and descendants of Moses by birth and by heritage, between them and those who truly believed the word of God. They believed that Jesus was his son, and they believed the words of Jesus. That belief comes with responsibilities and, yes, privileges and blessings as well. He says to abide in his word. Living in Jesus' word has an influence on every aspect of our daily lives. He, he says that living out his words makes you his disciples. Someone who serves the Lord is a disciple. And then the wonderful truths of God will be apparent to you. You shall know the truth. And then those truths will give you real freedom. So the promise is not just the truth will make you free, like you sometimes hear people quote. It's all those things in a sequence. And so our life lesson to start out with builds one step on another and brings us to the promise. Believe in Jesus, live in his word, serve him, know the truth, be free. Believe in Jesus, live in his word, serve him, know the truth, be free. And yes, this is something that people do need to hear in its fullness, not just in an empty misrepresentation of Jesus' words, and that brings us to the next life lesson. Share the truths of Jesus in the same way that he shared them. 
in the proper context and with wisdom and love. Share the truths of Jesus in the same way that he shared them, in the proper context and with wisdom and love. And finally, we explored the fact that what some people call freedom is actually an enemy's trap to enslave us in more sin and darkness. And so be careful always to remember this next life lesson. This is like rapid fire life lessons. <laughs> the next one is that we can be set free to do right, but we must never abuse our freedom as an excuse to do wrong. We can be set free to do right, but we, would, we, but we must never abuse our freedom to do wrong. Mm -hmm. Believe in Jesus, abide in his word, become his disciples, know the truth, be free. That's what he's saying. So what's their response? Verse 33, they answered him, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you will be made free? <laughs> now, we've seen multiple times here, immediately following Jesus teaching an incredible truth, there are detractors that want to argue with them. Now, the words here are not spoken, I don't think, by the majority of the people that were listening to him teach, those people who had come to believe in Jesus. Now, I'm sure those people were saying, hey, tell us more. They're standing waiting for more truths because Jesus soon does tell us more about that freedom. But no, right now we're hearing the minority, the loudmouths. <clears throat> Did I say that out loud? <laughs> Those who want to keep people from believing in Jesus. Um, in this case, it was the religious leaders. They're looking for a way to kill Jesus, following him around, trying to trap him. Uh, incidentally, you know, sometimes I, I meet people and they say, well, you know, I don't, I don't like religion. I don't like religious people. I'm not into that. When you, when you start trying to share Jesus with them. And hey, you can say, hey, Jesus didn't like religious people either. Take them to the book of John over and over. You'll see that. So how do we know that it was the enemies of the gospel that was speaking and, and asking this? And they weren't the believers? Well, first of all, they're lying. Okay. They're saying, you know, they're, they're challenging the teaching of Jesus and they, they're claiming they've never been in bondage. Okay, did they forget about Passover that they celebrate every year? That was celebrating the leaving the bondage under Pharaoh for, you know, so long? Did they forget the Philistines who God sent David to deliver them from? Or did they forget the captivity in Babylon, that captivity of, captivity of Persia and Syria? And even Rome, who even while they were saying, we've never been under bondage, they were being ruled over by Rome. And they had the, <laughs> they had the soldiers on the streets all around them while they were saying this. It was so ironic. Jesus was speaking the steps to learn the truth that would make listeners free. And the first thing these people say in response, uh, these arrogant leaders are making a mockery of the truth by speaking notorious, provable lies. Crazy. Worse yet, now it never happens in our society today, does it? <laughs> but worse yet, they completely missed that Christ spoke of a spiritual freedom, a freedom that goes beyond what's physically around us. So, you know, if, if they learned the truth, it would be captivating, enriching to your soul, uh, captivating the mind, changing your mind, um, freeing a person from error and prejudice and, you know, all these things that are so ugly in our world today. They were working against the offer of spiritual liberty by claiming they'd never been in bondage to any, any man. Obviously, again, they were wrong and in far worse condition, they were also in bondage to their lust for power. They were so addicted to deception that they didn't even realize how obvious their sin had become. I mean, I, I can almost hear the crowd and when they said that we've never been in bondage to anyone and the crowd gasping, it's like, what? What are they saying? That, that's, that's, that can't be true. So Jesus always responds in love and compassion. But this time he's getting a little, he's like, okay, I got to be very straight. Sometimes love and compassion is very straightforward, very frank. Verse 34, Jesus answered them, most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. To these people, he has talked to the people that are supposed to be the most holy in the group. So I'll get into the words here, specific words in just a moment, but what really stands out to me at this point is that there, there is still hope for those who are opposing him. What do you mean? Well, he didn't attack them for their lies. You notice he didn't, he didn't do what I just did? 
point out, no, you're lying, you're wrong. He didn't say all that. He just he didn't try to embarrass them. It was way too obvious. People already knew. But Jesus didn't waste time. He went directly to the heart of the matter, the sin. This gives us a tremendous guideline for us when we're talking with people. Our life lesson is don't engage in smoke screens, but share convincing truths. Don't engage in smoke screens that people throw up around you, but share convincing truths. Now, notice he said most assuredly. Now, we covered this before uh, in a previous teaching, but it's, it's, uh, in, in Hebrew, it's amen, amen. It means everybody listen up. Here is a truth, an incredibly important point, truth that everybody needs to hear. You know, write it down, take notes is what he's saying. He's being very straightforward. He's telling them it doesn't matter if they're descended from Abraham. And even if what they said had been true, that they'd never been enslaved or ruled over by anyone else, the fact that they sin at all causes them to be slaves of sin. Mm -hmm. And that slavery is <clears throat> voluntary. Think about it. People choose to sin. You know, I didn't, oh, I just accidentally lied. <sighs> no, it doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. It uh, doesn't happen by mistake. And Romans 3.23 says, tells us, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And that's just not something in the New Testament. Uh, surely Abraham's descendants that were standing there uh, were familiar with the scriptures in Psalms 14, 2 to 3, that says, The Lord looks down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there are any who understand, who seek God. They have all turned aside. They have together become corrupt. There is none who does good. How many? No, not one. So even people who might consider themselves to be free can be slaves. By the way, did you know that, free, uh, that, that slaves can't free themselves? And they can't free other slaves either. Okay? Oh, they may try to escape <laughs> the walls of a jail or a prison, but they're still in bondage. They're on the run. If they get away with it for years, they're still looking over their shoulders, living a life of anguish. <clears throat> and eventually they'll be found and they'll be turned over to a worse state than they were before. And, and honestly, it's sad to see someone that is enslaved. To anything and it's even sadder when they don't know it slavery to sin is the worst kind of slavery that there is they don't realize their chains are, are around them they enjoy parts of what is enslaving them and today in our text we, we see Jesus has a, again that love and compassion all over as he reveals to these people that they are indeed in bondage but he doesn't just leave them there he provides a way to be set free Verse 35, a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Now, Jesus is setting the scene here to, to show that sin is a slave master. It'll use you. It'll abuse you. It won't give you those long-term benefits of your, your work, your labor, the effort you put into it. And it'll throw you away at a moment's notice, just like someone would a slave. Okay? In other words, there's no future in being a slave, and especially in being a slave to sin. And then he gives the wonderful contrast of being family. Now, if you're a slave and then you start talking about the family, oh, our family is great, we have these privileges, we have, you know, this freedom. And, you know, you're looking and saying, hey, what are you telling me about that for? Well, that's where he comes in and gives you the eternal solution. Verse 36, therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. Jesus Christ offers us our freedom. He has the authority and the power, we've seen that over and over, to make people truly free. Now, in what ways are people free? Well, he can, you know, let's go back to the, you know, someone enslaved in prison. He can discharge prisoners. I mean, he can declare the penalty for the offense has been satisfied. The debt's been paid in full. That's what Jesus did on the cross. Pay the debt for our sins. So he, he has the power and the right to, to Take that away. He has the power to rescue bond slaves. He breaks the power of corruption. The soul is corrupted through sin, but he heals that over. So the soul is set free. He also has the power to naturalize foreigners. Now that sounds a little odd, doesn't it? He can, he can, he can declare an illegal person, immigrant to be totally legal and in the family. Okay, why is that important? Well, because we heard, we read earlier in, in the scriptures, salvation is from the Jews. Yes, God set up this nation to 
be a light to the world, the nation of Israel, and salvation does come through the Jews. For those not born Jewish, Jesus authorizes our adoption into the family of God. Yes. So we become a naturalized citizen of, of the kingdom of God. Now, an example of what we, uh, we studied back in John 1.16, um, one, John 1.16 says, and of his fullness we have all received and grace for grace, or grace upon grace. And these graces are piled up one on top of the other. We're forgiven. We're healed of that corruption sin brings into our lives. We're brought into the family of God with privileges. We're free from prison, free from corruption, free to take advantage of the privileges we have and not be as people ruled over by a firm hand of God whipping. No, but as sons and daughters in his family. Wow. <laughs> Who would not want that? And then Jesus, beyond that, he added the word indeed. And that's over and above him saying you'll be set free a few verses earlier. So, uh, you know, my mind is a little weird. It's like, why did he put indeed in here? Well, the word, looked it up, in the original word there means a lot more. It's, it means truly, in reality, in a point of fact, and in a p opposition to fictitious or false. And it's the same word translated uh, as certainly in Luke 23, 47, after the crucifixion and those things that took place around the crucifixion, um, it says, so when the centurion saw what had happened, he glorified God saying, certainly this was a righteous man. Now, both of those statements convey a full assurance, no room for falsehood or doubt that these were the truth. Our life lesson is there is no doubt. Jesus provides freedom from sin and adoption into and privileges of being in God's family. There is no doubt Jesus provides freedom from sin and adoption into and privileges of being in God's family. Now I've been blessed to go to, to jails and prisons to share the good news of Jesus with inmates there. And um, you know, once people have received the Lord, I, I hear a common theme over and over. They say, you know, once Jesus forgave my sins, I've been freer inside these walls than I ever was on the outside. What a testimony. What a testimony. Now, being free indeed does not come from an earthly family that's added the word free to their name <clears throat> or in your biological DNA, as these children of Abraham were saying. I, I looked it up, the, the meanings of names of countries, and there are about 10 countries around the world that have put the name free, either in the full name of their country or their country name actually means free in their language. But when you hear names, the country names like in, in the socialist country of France, or the Muslim country of Iran, or Liberia, the first thing that comes to our mind is certainly not the freedom that God gives us, okay? Um, in our text, the message is clearly communicated. True freedom flows from your belief and your relationship to Jesus Christ then abiding in his word, being his disciple, serving him, knowing the truth. And as Jesus is teaching here, it, it seems some of them there seem to begin to understand. And at the same time, you know, there's different, different people. There's a lot of people he's teaching here. And others have begun hardening their hearts. And for right now, Jesus is addressing those who had begun hardening their hearts. And he addresses them more frankly. Verse 37, I know that you are Abraham's descendants, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. I speak what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have seen with your father. And they answered him, answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Then Jesus said to them, if you are Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me a man who has told you the truth which I heard from God. Abraham did not do this. You do the deeds of your father. So he's trying to explain to them <laughs> what they are doing. He certainly admitted that his opponents were Abraham's descendants in a genetic sense, but Abraham was not their father in a spiritual sense. Why? Well, we read in Genesis 18, when messengers from heaven came to Abraham, what did he do? He didn't say, hey, I'm going to kill you. You're strangers. I don't like what you're saying. No, he received them gladly. By, but, but these other genetic 
descendants of Abraham were rejecting Jesus, rejecting his teaching, trying to kill him, and trying to kill someone who God sent from heaven to teach you. And, you know, write this down if, if, if you need to, but trying to kill somebody sent from God is certainly not an earmark of spiritual children of Abraham in anybody's book. <laughs> right? Jesus declared, my word has no place in you. Now, he wasn't saying here that God's word did not apply to his detractors, but rather that their rejection of the word of Jesus uh, and, and rejecting Jesus as the word of God proved that they were not at all like Abraham. And they, didn't, they did not have the freedom that comes from abiding in Christ's word. So please consider there are several aspects to God's word in our lives. How do you know if... God's word has a place in your life. Well, the first is that you should, it should have an inward, should be inside you and have a permanent place in your life. Not something that you just use like a, like a GPS roadmap. Okay, I got this map. Okay, I got to Kernersville <laughs> and I don't need it anymore. Just swipe it off the screen. I don't need it anymore. That's not how God's word works. When, when God gives you part of his word, you hear part of his word. Yes, it's going to apply to right then, but also it'll come up later on. So keep it in your heart. We should also hold God's word in a high place of honor, a place of trust, a place of authority in our lives, and a place that our affections are centered upon. You can grow to love God's word because you, you trust it. You, you know it over and over. So Jesus reminded them what he, he did was consistent with his father, and also what they were doing was consistent with their father. Now, I'm, I'm sure they probably didn't see what was going to hit them next, as Jesus would soon clearly tell them who their father was. What did they do? They're bragging again. Abraham is our father. <laughs> the religious leaders once again claimed Abraham is their father. It was true in a genetic sense, but Jesus was talking about spiritual. Jesus had agreed they're descendants of Abraham, not spiritual children of Abraham, because they sought to kill Jesus. Again, he very clearly declared Abraham would never do the deeds that they were doing, would never act like they were acting. They exposed, he exposed, the inconsistency in their life. People don't like that when you do that to them. Someone was talking about hypocrites earlier. <laughs> yeah, we, we don't like to be called a hypocrite. And, and Jesus, by telling them the truth, was exposing their hypocrisy. They said they were children of Abraham, they didn't act like it, his point was important. And it's important for us because our spiritual heritage tends to determine our nature and our destiny. If we're born again and have God as our father, it will show in our nature and destiny. Whether our spiritual father is Abraham or Adam, <laughs> you know, in the beginning, or Satan himself. That will also show in our nature and destiny, just as it shows in these adversaries of Jesus. And, you know, what are these people to do at this point? When Jesus is talking to them. Well, at this point, it, I think it would have been wise for them to stop for a few minutes, just reflect on it and say, you know, I, I see what you mean. We really need to step back and consider what you've shared and find out how to be more like our father Abraham. So we see in the next verse, no, no, they didn't do that. <laughs> it didn't happen. Instead, they apparently, you know, they went and got some shovels and started to dig a deeper and deeper hole in the very same spot they had tried to dig before, and, and they hit rocks. Remember earlier in the chapter, they were snidely asking Jesus, where is your father? Okay, they were implying he was an illegitimate child because of the virgin birth. Everybody knew he was supernaturally born. Um, you know, they, they didn't learn from the lessons that Jesus had taught them just a few verses before. Um, I think they'd run out of stupid things to say. They didn't know what to say. <laughs> they came back again, um, you know, kind of begging for, for more trouble. Well, verse 41, it says, Then they said to him, We were not born of fornication. We have one Father, God. Again, different words, but the same implication that Jesus was an illegitimate child. And, you know, ignoring the huge volume of, of evidence uh, at Jesus' time, I mean, at the time of Jesus' birth. Now remember, there were witnesses to the birth. There were witnesses to the supernatural thing. Some of the most godly men of that time and, and women, uh, Simeon and his wife, there, and they say, hey, I've seen the Messiah. I mean, it was very obvious. It was very, it's a big deal. It said all Jerusalem knew what had happened when Jesus was born and came and, and his child was, and he was dedicated at the temple. And yet they're ignoring all of that. 
Then verse 42, Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God, nor have I come of myself, but he sent me. Once again, Jesus leaves no room for someone to love God or say they love God, but then reject Jesus and his claim that he and the Father were one. So they are so close in nature. They are so close. At, and if someone truly loves God, they're going to truly love Jesus. You, you can't separate that. It's a unity of nature. It's a, it's a unity of purpose and a unity of will between God the Father and Jesus the Son. So evident here. Now, Jesus had both his credentials, you know, we've studied that over and over, and his instructions from God. So, wouldn't all of God's children want to embrace the messenger sent from the Father in a mission to save the world? Well, of course, the obvious answer is yes, but the Jews in this case made it clear they were not kin to God because their hatred towards Jesus pulled them away from that. Those who continued in unbelief were so far from God you know, it's, it's just, you know, it saddens me. Uh, I mean, there's some people look at a dramatic conflict, good guys against bad guys. Well, you know, Jesus has a compassion for everyone, and he wants them to understand. And sometimes they, they get to the point where they, they will not. They refuse to understand. And sometimes they don't even understand the language that he's saying. Now, they knew it. He knew it. And Jesus says in verse 43, Why do you not understand my speech? because you are not able to listen to my word. Now that's kind of kind of a weird thing to say. <laughs> Let's check it out. Jesus gave the, the listeners ample opportunity to listen to his teaching, and they were listening with their ears to his words. We've, we've seen him explain the same concept in multiple ways, both in words and also in his good works and his deeds and what he did uh, on, the, on this planet. He even told them stories, the parables, and, and other stories to simplify the meanings to a level where anybody could understand. Yet, they heard what he was saying. They knew the definitions of the words that he was, he, that he was saying. They knew what the words meant, but it was almost as if they had a, a scrambler inside their head. And they put together a different story than what he was telling. You ever wonder about that? Now, in reality, what was, <laughs> that really was what was happening. Let's hear Jesus explain it in the next few verses. Uh, verse 44, you are of your father the devil and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there's no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources for he is a liar and the father of it. But because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. And we've all seen it. The same words said in different way, said in the same way from the same person, but heard by different people with different worldviews, are processed differently. I'm just going to throw one thing out here. Uh, we've heard a lot about race in the last year. You know, take the concept of, of race. In a purely biblical view, there is only one race on the planet right now: Adam's race, also called the human race. Now, in a warped godless worldview, people intentionally sort people out by what? How much melanin is in their skin? Weird. And then they assign characteristics to those people because of that different shades that they are. And, and they wrongly call them, you know, they call some black and white and red and yellow. I've, I've seen red, okay, I gotta admit, I have seen red people. I haven't never seen a white person, I've never seen a black person, I've never seen a person that was yellow, although my dad had a liver issue, and he, they said he did turn quite yellow. I didn't see him then. <laughs> but, you know, there's now, I mean, we, we've seen scientifically proven that there is more diversity inside groups that have a similar skin color. In other words, they're more different with the same skin color than those, than between groups with different skin tones. Now, anthropologic, anthropologically, is that the right word? Anthropologically. Those guys that study cultures and, and stuff, uh, they, they've proven centuries ago that it's the very same thing, that there's more diversity from one group to another, I mean, inside the group, than there is from one group to another. And over 20 years ago, DNA science confirmed the same thing, no shadow, no, without a shadow of a doubt. You know, I am I'm more closely related to someone with a different skin tone than I have, than I am to those with the same skin tone. But guess what? We were growing up, we, as we we're coming up, we were told 
There are different races. He's this race, he's that race, she's this race. We're being asked to check out, check off census data blocks uh, and surveys and applications. Um, and, and they have on them between four and sometimes as many as a dozen different race choices that we're supposed to check off. I always check other and put human. Okay, I'd encourage y'all to do that as well until they stop taking these stupid questions <laughs> off of these surveys and these, these censuses. But still today, it's nearly impossible to convince most people of the clear biblical and scientific truth that there is only one race within the human family. So that's showing where even though the evidence is there, the truth is there, it goes inside someone's ears and someone's head, gets scrambled by what they're looking through, the worldview they're looking through, and it comes out wrong. So Jesus' words here, he, he's not saying they're lacking intelligence, although I'm sorry, I, I did call them stupid a little while ago. Um, but he's trying, they're trying to understand his teaching through the eyes of the person or the, the influence that they have been most affected by. And in this case, and he's pointing it out, it's the devil. It's Satan's, his lies, his tricks, his deception, and, and his, his lust for power. Their lust for power equates to the lust for power that Satan had that caused him to be thrown out of heaven. So anyway, they're, they're, they can't evaluate and process the truth of God. In this situation, it is a spiritual issue. It's not an intellectual issue. They were a couple of things they were prejudiced about what part of the country that Jesus came from, where he lived, uh, some of the places that he ministered in, they didn't like him, and so they made fun of him for that. They were jealous. Um, they were, they had, those jealousies were deeply rooted in, in traditions that only certain people could know God or only certain people could teach about God, and he wasn't one of them. There were artificial ministry boundaries that people were not supposed to cross, and Jesus was crossing them. There were religious issues that had been so closely aligned with political issues that it became almost impossible to tell the difference between the spiritual and the political affiliations. Uh, that never happens in our country today. Mm -hmm. So this confusion in Israel, ancient Israel, was a tactic of the devil to keep people from seeing the glorious truths of God. And as you've been thinking, again, it's not much different today, is it? Many times the enemy of our souls uses those same divisive and confusing tactics to take our hearts and minds away from the truth and reality of Jesus' teaching today. Our life lesson for this is that the ability to listen to and truly understand the words of Jesus is a precious gift we should not take for granted. The ability to listen to and truly understand the words of Jesus is a precious gift that we should not take for granted. Jesus also revealed in our text that the native language of the devil is lies okay the natural response of the devil to a, a fulfilled godly life is lies the natural response of godly life is to kill it that's what the devil wants to do john 10 10 tells us about his plan and tells us what jesus does in response john 10 10 says the thief satan does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy i have come jesus talking i have come that they may have life and they may have it more abundantly. If the devil can't kill you, he'll try to destroy you. If he can't destroy you, he'll at least try to steal from you. Try to steal your joy, if nothing else. Don't let him do it. Most of the problems that we face as believers can be found in that one verse that I just read. What the devil is trying to do to you. When you understand that, you may ask, can this blindness coming from the devil, from his view, be changed? And Jesus answers it. Yes, absolutely. He can give you real, true, eternal life. He wants to provide that real life to every person. Now, even in this somewhat heated exchange, Jesus asks in the next verse, verse 46, the beginning of it says, which of you convicts me of sin? Once again, he's giving an open invitation to those that wanted to kill him. An open invitation to declare some sin in him, any sin in him, for which they would, they, they would kill him. Of course, he knew they wouldn't because they couldn't. They couldn't find any sin in him. He gave them another opportunity to think about it, to change their minds, to repent, to believe in him, and let the truth win out. He gave them every opportunity. Then in verse 46b, he, he comes back and says, If I tell you the truth, why, you, why do you not believe me? He who is of God hears God's word. Therefore, you do not hear because you're not of God. 
Then the Jews answered and said to him, Do we not rightly say that you're a Samaritan and have a demon? And Jesus answered, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father, and you dishonor me. See, these folks were frustrated. They are exasperated. They couldn't even make him look bad. And more and more people began to, to believe in Jesus. And with no possible way to lodge a charge against him, what do they do? They revert back to name-calling and innuendos. Mm -hmm. They were obviously looking to build themselves up and tearing Jesus down, and that doesn't go well. Life lesson that we can take away from this is that when Jesus gives you a chance to consider your error, to repent, to turn to him, just go ahead and repent. When Jesus gives you a chance to consider your error, to repent, and to turn to him, just go ahead and repent. Jesus' enemies didn't repent here. They missed a great chance to have their life changed for eternity. In Jesus' response, we also notice he didn't bother to con comment on the intended ins insult. You know, they, they called him, oh, you're a Samaritan. Well, that was supposed to be an insult. But you know, after Jesus' earlier experiences in Samaria and seeing how the people in Samaria were so hungry for the truth of God, I don't think Jesus would have even considered that to be an insult, at least not the insult that they meant it to be. But he would not let such a blasphemous charge as saying he's demon-possessed go unanswered. I mean, he's God. He knew the demons. He knew the former angels that had rebelled against God, how they had been uh, thrown out of heaven with, with Satan. And he's like, no. <laughs> that's, a, that's a false, a dishonoring, disrespectful charge coming out of hearts that are full of darkness, full of sin. And um, in the next verses, a little later on, the next time we're, we're together, uh, we'll dig into some more of that. But um, in verse 50, I, I want to end on a positive note. Verse 50, Jesus is still speaking. And I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks and judges. 51, most assuredly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never see death. Amen. Wow. Never see death. Now, for a believer, these are incredible words. And you see that the full meaning of the word translated as see here only conveys a little bit. We shall never see death. Well, my grandma, she was a wonderful Christian, but she died. Well, no, it's much more intense than seeing with your eyes. The sight mentioned here is that a, defined as a long, steady, exhaustive vision, whereby, whereby we somehow become slowly acquainted with the nature of the object to which it is directed. In other words, you see, you dwell on it, you're... You know, you're agonizing, you're gazing upon death, and you're foreseeing your own doom. That's what he was talking about. You're never going to be that way. Because when the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ comes in and changes your heart, changes your soul, you continue in his word, you're completely turned around. I mean, we're all headed to death, towards death. When we, are, you know, when, when we start loving, right? from the time you're born, you start dying, they say, right? Yeah. But when, you, when Jesus changes your view to eternal life, you turn around this way, what's behind you, you never see it again. And, and if the devil says, hey, look back there, it's like, nope, uh -uh. not mine. That's not where I'm going. Why should I even look at it? So it, it's a wonderful verse. Um, you can, can, you're completely turned around. Your back is towards death, not your face. Your face is towards life eternal. You'll never see the gloom and doom. Okay? Someone says, oh, you got gloom and doom preachers. Not if you're headed the right way. Not at all. Um, I don't want to see the horrors that an unforgiven soul will experience in death. There is hope for that freedom in Jesus Christ. There's hope to be free from the sin and death that is brought um, by, by sin. And you can do that by putting your faith and trust in Jesus. You, he will provide that sin. He'll give you the real, true freedom, true everlasting life. I pray that you are experiencing that freedom and uh, that you're living with abiding in the word of Christ I hope you're truly living as a disciple and a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ today, not wandering aimlessly through life, wondering what's, what I'm going to do, where am I going to go. You know, you know what you're going to do when you have Jesus as your Savior. You have eternal life. That's where you're headed. And everything else God helps guide along the way. Now, if you're struggling in any of these areas, please let me know. I wanted to let you know you're not alone. You're not the only one. We've all struggled in these areas and likely will continue to struggle. <laughs> probably until the last breath leaves our body because there's an enemy that's trying to, to lie to us and trying to deceive us. But don't live in that defeat. Live in the victory over sin. Enjoy the freedom in Christ today and 
Uh, again, we'd love to chat with you if you let us know your needs. So as we close, I want to pray a blessing over you. It's been prayed over believers for thousands of years from God's word. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the powerful name of Yeshua HaMashiach, our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen.